Good afternoon. Um, we'd like to welcome you to uh, the latest installment in Stratwater's uh, webinar series. Uh, I'm very pleased to welcome three of my colleagues to a roundtable today. Um, many of you may be familiar with Stratwater. Um, my name is Jeff Summer. I'm the Managing Director. Um, for 35 years, Stratwater has worked with rural hospitals and health systems, community hospitals, to help them overcome uh, and succeed in a challenging environment. Um, the current set of issues that we face with uh, COVID-19 and its disruptions to the healthcare system are unprecedented. Um, but in the longer view of those 35 years, uh, perhaps the, the most recent and most significant challenge uh, that our clients have faced. Um, over the last few months, we've marshaled an, uh, a series of resources to help our clients address these issues. And today's webinar is the uh, most recent installment of that. Um, with that in mind, um, let me introduce our panelists today. Um, our first panelist is Opal Greenway. Um, Opal is a native of the great state of Idaho. Um, she's a director of the firm and is also leader of our physician practice advisory um, uh, service line. And uh, in that role, she assesses transactions, examines and uh, um, provides guidance on stark and anti-kickback regulations and compliance and analyzes physician compensation structures. She's also an expert in physician hospital alignment strategies and ambulatory surgery uh, development and operational improvement. Um, so we're glad to have Opal with us today to answer some of your questions. Our next panelist is Jonathan Pattenberg. Jonathan is a, a principal with the firm. He is uh, head of our performance improvement service line. Uh, Jonathan comes to Stratwater with uh, expertise advising for-profit, not-for-profit, and governmental entities through complex uh, issues, including cost reduction, acquisitions, uh, financial analyses, and uh, operational assessments. Uh, John has also uh, been the chief financial officer of a critical access hospital in uh, Hawaii and brings that set of skills and expertise to his consulting practice here at Stroudwater. Uh, lastly, I'd like to introduce uh, Eric Schell. Uh, Eric is the chairman of Stradwater, um, and for the last uh, 30 years has been focused on working with healthcare provider organizations to help them succeed in a complicated and dynamic uh, operating envir environment. Uh, for the bulk of those 30 years, Eric has been uh, head of our rural practice here at Stradwater, helping um, rural hospitals and health systems succeed in a, a challenging environment. Um, and so with that, what I'd like to do is turn the conversation over to Eric, who has uh, some information he'd like to share with you, and then we'll, we'll allow each of the panelists to um, uh, share their presentations. Their presentations have been crafted to address many of the questions we received uh, from uh, registrants to today's webinar. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, Jeff. Um, and I want to echo um, my welcome. Um, good more, uh, good afternoon to those, to many of you. Good morning to some of you. And um, what I want to do is just um, I'll briefly outline the agenda. Um, so we're going to cover the overview and introductions. Obviously, Jeff addressed that. Um, uh, or, or Opal, Jonathan, and myself, we are each going to spend around 10 minutes talking around uh, relevant topics. And then we're going to turn it over to the roundtable questions. Um, so, so, so with that, uh, we're going to get going right now. I'm, I'm, I'm going to address a few uh, challenges. For those of you who had participated in any of the, uh, my, the webinars we've held in the past, um, we ha had a series on, on kind of immediate cash planning as it related to the pandemic and, and the different opportunities. Um, as part of this presentation, um, I, I, the, the, those highlighted in blue here are, are those we just wanted to touch on because um, you know, may, maybe we, they're, they're important enough that we kind of understand them and move forward with a specific strategy to address them. So you know, these, and then there's a second page of, 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 of the cash planning and, and opportunities available. Again, we're going to focus on the one highlighted in blue here because it's, it's getting some traction and we want to talk about why that is. So to, to, to start off, um, 
uh, you know, kind of the the whole need for a cash flow projection. The, the, we, we harped on this um, back uh, six or eight weeks ago when we first did our webinar. We addressed it again a month ago when we did a, a second webinar. But having rural hospitals and health systems understand where they're going to be from a cash position out 26 weeks or 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 52 weeks is absolutely critical and because you know obviously the beginning cash balances are relevant the reduced volume um, increased expenses cash impacts on changing labor costs whether they be upward or downward um, all of the different um, um, ca cash that has been coming in through the cares act um, and then and then all of these are pieces that we can factor in and i just want to I, I showed this example the last couple but but it's but it's important to show this is an example of a critical access hospital that um, had a beginning cash balance of a million dollars. Um, they tapped this this example hospital tapped into the Medicare accelerated payments, the the the, the PPP loan, the the uh, general distribution, the targeted distribution. Uh, in this model, we assumed a 50% decline in volume beginning on the, the 15th of March. Um, and the important thing to note here is that after 26 weeks. The cash was was a five and a half million dollars greater than it was at the start. Why this is important is because we're seeing rural hospitals making decisions uh, throughout the country around um, uh, you know furloughing staff, laying off the, uh, laying off providers, doctors, nurse practitioners, and and I and I think to have a better understanding of our cash position going out in some distant period is exactly what we should have before we start making decisions. There was a question asked around when do we bring um, people back? Well, it starts with understanding where your cash is going to be to determine when you want to bring people back. So I can't stress enough how important this cash projection is. Um, there's a resource on our website. It's an Excel spreadsheet that one of our colleagues created. It is excellent. Everybody that's used it has said, oh my gosh, this is great. It's really easy and it's very meaningful. Just go grab it, download it, use it. The second area I just wanted to touch on briefly was the 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 the, 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 um, um, the public health and so social services emergency fund. This is the general distribution and the targeted distribution. So th there's a whole lot in that first paragraph, but, but recognize that there was fifty billion dollars distributed through a general distribution, um, and then there were targeted distributions around you know the ten ten billion dollar rural. There was a $10 billion safety net um, distribution that, that was just done two, two weeks ago. Um, and, then, and then there's additional information that can be um, for uninsured folks needing COVID-related um, um, treatments. Uh, the second piece I want to recognize is that there's an additional $75 billion of COVID, uh, of, of CARES Act funding in this, in this um, you know, PFSSEF funds that has yet to be distributed. And, 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 and right now, um, you know, from my understanding, I spoke with a friend of mine who's the CEO of a rural hospital in the Midwest last week who had met with some senators and representatives. They're all trying to figure out right now what's an equitable distribution methodology for this, this 75 billion that at this point we don't know. Um, and so it, let's, let, let's, let's, let's plan. At some point, we're gonna be getting cash from this as long as that continues to, be, to, to hold through. Couple things. Uh, I've had questions asked around, you know, what is a qualifying expense um, as it relates to these? And um, you know, here's a list of those things. Um, and, and, and one of the most important pieces is it is is it's a qualifying expense as long as it's non-reimbursable from other sources. And it includes building or retrofitting ICUs, increased staffing, protective uh, protect uh, personal protective equipment, building temporary structures. Um, and then this last piece, which is big, foregone revenue from canceled procedures. And, 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 and um, you know, I've got some comments on that related to how we want to think about that as a critical access hospital in particular. Uh, I think one of the big points is HHS encourages the use of funds to cover lost revenue so that providers can respond to COVID-19 by maintaining, by maintaining health care delivery capacity. This is, you know, they've set aside dollars specifically so that we didn't completely, you know, kind of furlough and 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 get rid of, you know, so many of our important care providers. And 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 this was the intent of these dollars. 
Uh, there was the rural distribution. I just have uh, some points in here that, that was paid out uh, a little over a month ago, $10 billion. Many of our rural hospitals that, that, that I've seen got anywhere between three and $4 million. Um, um, rural health clinics got 100,000 plus um, per designated site, and then federally qualified health centers also in rural areas also received some additional dollars. Um, around some of the attestation, within 90 days of the receipt of payment, we have to go into the portal and attest to the conditions. Um, uh, there's a number of conditions, one of them being this, this, this requirement that we don't, um, um, uh, it's, it's that whole um, um, uh, out-of-network, in-network provider. Um, uh, also providers, and this is, going to have to, this is going to be coming up on us very quickly, is that 10 days after the end of each quarter in which we receive greater than 150000 we have to go into the portal and provide uh, um, you know, kind of the funds that were received along with how those funds were distributed to meet some of the criteria of this program. Now that's that's going to be July 10th, which is uh, you know j j just three weeks out. So be ready and prepared for that. Um, yeah, I'm going to skip over that one. It's, it's too much. The second thing is um, the, the the payroll protection. Many of us filed for the payroll protection and received funds. I know our firm was able to to, to do that. Uh, the point we want to make here is that that um, on 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 June 5th. So last, a little more than a week ago, uh, the, the Payroll Protection Program Flexibility Act was signed into law, changed some big pieces of that, allowed the forgiveness period uh, of um, from dollars spent from eight weeks to go all the way out to 24 weeks and reduced the payroll requirement um, to allow this forgiveness from 75% to 60%. Um, hopefully what that means is, is a significant piece, if not all, of many of our payroll protection dollars that we got are going to be forgiven. Uh, this one is the, the, the last piece I want to stress because um, you know, I just got off the phone with a friend of mine who's the CEO of a, uh, a critical access hospital in upstate New York. Um, the, 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 the idea of getting an interim cost report prepared immediately um, and, and getting updated rates from your MAC so that they can be submitted to your Medicare Advantage plans. Your Medicare Advantage plans right now are, are, are kind of benefiting from this because our unit costs for Medicare have skyrocketed and, and, and they're continuing to pay old rates. And so the concern here, you know, obviously the concern is, is timing is an issue. Every day that we don't have an interim cost report with updated rates, that, that we're losing money on our Medicare Advantage plans. So, um, you know, my, my, my discussion, you know, 10 minutes ago with the, this uh, C, well, the CFO um, of this rural hospital upstate New York is, is they're, 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 they're in a fight right now with their MAC, NGS, NGS um, on this issue. Um, NGS wants them to just submit on a, a pro, or going back from January 1st to May 31st information. And, and, and which is not going to be real. I mean, really, the, the, what you want to submit is from, you know, the March, April, May time frame and then trend that out. But ultimately, do a pro, you know, so, so do an interim cost report, but, but model it out prospectively, factoring in reduced volumes for however long your system projects those reduced volumes. Get higher rates, get those submitted to a MAC. I can't stress that enough. Um, right now, um, they've gone to state represent or, or federal um, senators, uh, U.S. senators, and U.S. representatives in the state of New York to fight with them um, to, to make sure this gets passed. So anybody that can get on board and, and get, get their max, um, all the help we can get would be grateful. Uh, and the last area is, is figuring out a way to grow patient volume. Um, you know, I'm, I'm listening to advertisements from, from, from hospitals around Maine here because um, I haven't traveled outside of Maine, unfortunately. And, and, a, and a lot of it is around, hey, we're open for services again, come see us. But, but what's not being said is that we're safe, come see us. And I think anything that we can do around stressing the safety and how we've created a safe env environment for patients to come back to is going to accelerate our volume coming back into our organization. Fully engage around telehealth. Um, you're seeing all kinds of news out there around telehealth. Um, and then and then get plans to start. So let's get that volume back as quickly as possible. So 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 with that, I'm going to turn over uh, the presentation to, to to our colleague John Pattenberg to talk about some of the rural health clinic opportunities. 
Thanks, Eric. So when we talk about all these different opportunities, what we're coming to find is that organizations are having to grapple with declining reimbursements and declining volumes, but at constantly increasing expense structure. So as we start to look forward, and we get this question often is, how do we start to improve the financial performance of an organization, realizing that our rates are not going up as much as our expenses are going up. So as we start to look at these different opportunities, we need to realize there's different ways that we can improve our financial performance through different designation types, through different ways to actually look at alignment. What we need to get away from is really looking at business as usual. So the methodology of business as usual and continuing across that path is not working for systems and hospitals. We are starting to see where expense structures are consistently outpacing the reimbursements, and that's ultimately putting them in a worse financial position looking forward. So what I really wanted to start by talking about is that really an approach to revenue optimization. Um, as we frame the next three slides, I, I really frame these around the most questions we received around the rural health clinics and from the people that signed up. And when we talk about it, there's really four main opportunities that we can look at as a means to improve the financial performance. Now, this isn't a catch-all for all of them. There's additional opportunities, but I really wanted to highlight the top four that we work with most systems on to improve their financial performance. The first one is really looking at converting all eligible practices, whether it's at a hospital, whether it's at a system, but really look at the optimal designation type for that clinic. So maybe we have some freestanding clinics. Those are clinics that are not provider-based. Maybe we have some provider-based clinics that should be rural health clinics. Again, it's looking at the optimal designation of those practices and pursuing the designation to improve the financial performance. So that's one of the major ways that we can start to improve our financial position. The next is really looking at realigning practices within a health system. So maybe we have a large uh, 10 hospital system that has a, a private physician group and all of the physicians are employed by that physician group and we're operating it as a freestanding clinic where all we are billing is the professional fees. Because rural opportunities and designation types afford us different reimbursement advantages, if we could realign some of those practices under maybe a critical access hospital or a hospital of fewer than 50 beds, that can open up certain reimbursement advantages that aren't afforded to private physician groups or if we're operating under a hospital with 100 beds or plus. So again, it's looking at the alignment of those practices. We've done a number of these studies where we've looked at the realignment of practices and it's considerably improved the financial performance of, of the system. Um, Multi-million dollar benefits. So again, it's, it's, it's looking at those opportunities around the alignment. Another big opportunity is really around the rural health clinic program and looking at the integration of specialty providers into those rural health clinics. So there is a requirement that rural health clinics have to be predominantly, that is 50% primary care. However, so long as we meet that 51%, 50% requirement, we're able to integrate specialty providers into that rural health clinic as a means to one, expand access to care, but also to get that uncapped cost-based reimbursement if we align it under a hospital of fewer than 50 beds. And when we think of a cost structure, we generally pay orthopedic surgeons, neurosurgeons, cardiologists, all of those providers make considerably more than a primary care physician. So aligning a specialty provider in a rural health clinic for one or two days a week can have a significant impact on reimbursements and really how we look to leverage that strategy. The last one is really looking at as we move more towards capitation and the accumulation and attribution of lives, is starting to reach out to independent practices and looking at acquiring those practices and operating them as either provider-based clinics or provider-based rural health clinics. Again, leverage all of those strategies. There is no one-size-fits-all approach to every system. One system may leverage the rural health clinic program. If you have a practice that is very productive and the doctors are turning a bunch of visits, it may be more advantageous to make it a provider-based clinic. Again, we want to look at all of these different opportunities so that we can improve the financial position of our hospital. Next slide, Eric. So next what I wanted to talk about is really the most common regulatory either questions, concerns, discussions 
um, really the ones that, that cause the most angst or the, the lack of following one of these specific opportunities. The first one is really about the creation of off-campus provider-based locations. So one of the big misconceptions around the rural health clinic program and aligning them those are under critical access hospitals is if we were to create a provider-based rural health clinic, that that location has to meet the either 15 mile on secondary or 35 mile on primary roads. The rural health clinics are actually exempt from that. So what that allows us to do is we can actually create and align and designate a rural health clinic that is within either the 15 miles or 35 miles from the next closest facility. So this really makes those critical access hospitals a little bit more advantageous because it allows us again to get that uncapped cost-based reimbursement for that rural health clinic by aligning it under that critical access hospital. Now, I really wanted to highlight too, because there seems to be some misconceptions around what is on campus and off campus is. The way Medicare actually defines off campus is if you're greater than 250 yards away from the facility. So in this case, uh, we'll say a critical access hospital. It's from the facility or the building itself. It's not from the edge of the property. So if you're on a 20 acre parcel of property and your hospital is in the middle of that property, you cannot go to the edge of that property and do 250 yards from there. It's 250 yards from the facility wall. So that's a key distinction right there because what ends up happening is, is as we start to align these facilities and we expand the footprint of hospitals, we may set one up down the road or across the street or wherever else and think that it's within 250 yards. We want to be very careful as we're establishing these different programs and pursuing these designations that we don't do anything to jeopardize a critical access hospital designation or a rural health clinic designation. We want to ensure that we protect that and not put ourselves in a worse financial position. That was almost a perfect role for it, Eric. You were right on. <laughs> the next one what I want to talk about is, and this is one that I have, I've probably had a hundred or so conversations around this over the past year. Um, really, what is a department of a provider? So when we look at our provider-based rules, the 413.65, which is our provider-based rules applicable to hospitals, they go on to say that a department of a provider is any entity that operates as a part of the main provider for the purposes of furnishing healthcare services. Now, there's a bunch of additional stuff in there um, that I left out. The most important part that I want to highlight is for the purposes of the provider-based rules, a rural health clinic is not a department of a provider. So anywhere that we read the provider-based rules that says a department of a provider must, a department of a provider must, rural health clinics are exempt from those requirements. Now, this isn't to say that they're exempt from all of the provider-based rules. They're not. There are many that are applicable. However, there are certain rules that do not apply to the rural health clinic program. So one of the first ones I want to highlight is the public awareness. This is 41365B4. So with the provider-based rules, it states that a department of a provider has to hold themselves out to the public um, on the exterior signage and such other ways as operating as a department of a provider. So we'll see this regularly throughout the country where it says some rehab department, and it'll say rehab department, a department of X hospital. The rural health clinics do not have to have that a department of X hospital on the signage because, again, they are not a department of the provider. They're exempt from that requirement. The other two major requirements that we also see have to deal with the location requirements. So the first one ties, again, to the rural health clinic rules. So rural health clinics are exact, ex actually exempt from the, they have to be within 35 miles of the hospital in which owns and operates them. So there are many rural health clinics that operate as provider based that are actually greater than 35 miles away from the hospital that owns and operates it. The furthest I've actually seen is about 120 miles away. And that clinic was actually owned and operated as a provider based department of that rural or that, that hospital. And what this means is that as we establish those departments as provider based, it allows us to access programs such as 340B if we qualify. 
If we align it under a hospital of fewer than 50 beds, it allows us to get that uncapped cost-based rate. So again, what it allows us to do is start to create regional strategies for systems that leverage these designation types to improve the financial performance. We no longer have to align them under one hospital versus the other because of a regional or a 35 mile requirement. It gives us more latitude to approach from a strategic perspective and a reimbursement perspective as opposed solely to a location perspective. The last one which we often hear, and Eric and I have had many conversations about this before too, is that that provider-based clinic has to meet or serve 75% of the same patients that the hospital serves. That again is not applicable to rural health clinics. Rural health clinics are actually exempt from that requirement. So it allows you to establish that clinic that one is not aligned on the exact hospital proper or the hospital campus, or even within the same zip code. You can align them a region away and actually get that uncapped cost-based reimbursement. Now, we're not saying to go out and throw up clinics all across the state or all across a region. What we're saying is, is that we use this information to take a strategic and systematic approach so that we ensure that we're effectively aligned in delivering care, but then we're also getting reimbursed for those services. So again, it's, it's, it's approaching it from that strategic perspective. Um, I'm going to turn it over now to my colleague, Opal. Again, these are the most common questions we get. We just wanted to highlight some of them. Um, so thank you, Opal. Thanks, Jonathan. So I'm going to highlight three areas that we've been getting a lot of questions on. The first is regarding actual practice operations. As we're trying to ramp up, we've had to defer a lot of care that wasn't considered um, urgent care for these practices. Well, anything that wasn't absolutely necessary right then was pushed off and rescheduled for a later time. And as practices are ramping back up, eager to get their patients in, they're trying to understand how do they need to actually operate their practice in this new normal. There's been several things that have been impacting them. They might have released a number of their workers and furloughed employees or potentially even made layoffs in that preparing for what the new patient volumes are. Are patients going to feel safe going into those practices? So how do they create a new normal rather than, as I like how Jonathan put it, we're not trying to get back to business as usual. You are not, I would highly encourage you to use this actually as an opportunity to consider how can you optimize the performance of your practice rather than just trying to return to the status quo. And so the kind of questions that I've been getting about that are what are the most important things that we should be focusing on? The first is the workflow of your practice. It's everything from when the patient pulls up to the parking lot through when the patient leaves. What are all those different workflows and how do they need to change? Practices um, previously about a decade ago really tried to get rid of the plexiglass screen so that they could have a more um, you know, warm environment for patients to come into. Well, now they need to put those back up. They did. They took them down back before to create that environment. Now they need to go back up. What are the different safety protocols that need to be incorporated into your workflows? It used to be very standard to try to make sure if you had a great, if you're doing team-based care and you had this team to anticipate the physician's needs for specific types of patient visits, to have everything that that physician might need for that type of uh, service already in the room. That's something that can create waste now that previously didn't because now you're going to have to do re-sterilization of more instruments and more pieces than you might have previously. So going through those workflows and thinking about, all right, now I no longer have as many medical assistants as I might have previously because I'm bringing staff back uh, slowly. How does that impact my workflow? Am I now going to have to do more things as a physician than I did previously because I don't have the same level of staff? How, where are the staff located? If you used to do a pod based where staff could gather together to meet before visits and coordinate that kind of care, now that we need to do a greater amount of socially distancing, that doesn't apply just to patients. That needs to apply to your actual clinic facilities as well in the back and where the physicians are meeting with their nursing team to, do, to talk about that patient's care. So examine what, who's responsible for what in your clinic. Is that really the right person who is doing that job? Is that there somebody else who could be doing that that is a better fit for that? Is it something that we could do remotely? Is it something that needs to be done in the clinic? Everything that could be done at home, maybe it should be if you can do that appropriately with the right efficiencies. The other piece is to consider your metrics. What are you measuring in your practice? Most people are paying attention to their patient visits and pay attention very much to the metrics associated with the provider. 
what is the throughput of the provider. They don't think about the metrics necessarily of the additional support staff in the, that practice. So this is a time to think about how are we going to actually measure the performance of all the different members of staff. Mem uh, if you don't have something to evaluate your front desk people, that's something you should be putting in place. It shouldn't just be the providers because that allows you to identify the different things that are creating bottlenecks and the inefficiencies that might exist in a practice in a practice that actually impacts your providers throughput as well. And right now, when we know that it's going to take longer than the standard 15, 30, or 20, 40 blocks for seeing patients in this practice, we need to make sure we can reduce any inefficiencies that we have from there. When you come up with these metrics, obviously you need to measure them, but you have to monitor them. My experience with uh, staff is they do what is inspected, not what is expected. So just because you create a policy and you create a workflow and tell your staff, this is how it's going to be from now on, doesn't mean that they will necessarily do that. It's very easy to slip into old habits if you're not regularly inspecting them and making sure that you make adjustments as necessary and let people know what those adjustments are made. One of the other pieces in your practice that you're going to have to conform to is the fact that telehealth is here to stay. So a lot of the telehealth services that got allowed during COVID and then we started getting reimbursement for in your practice, you were allowed to do it with a certain amount of waivers, right? You were allowed to use FaceTime, you were allowed to use Skype to see patients. Those, that time period is ending and you're now going to have to make sure that you're in with HIPAA compliance and making sure that all of the telehealth services that you provide going forward, they may not be paid at parity that we've had during COVID. The amount where they were getting paid right now under Medicare to be able to match what they would have been in an in-office visit is greatly being reduced. And from the projections we've seen, we're expecting that telehealth services will be reimbursed at no more than 85% of what an in-person visit will be paid. So can you maintain those telehealth services, which your patients will expect you to maintain those and a reduced reimbursement. And the other thing that we're seeing with practices is the data gathering. A lot of people in facing COVID didn't, while the data might have been somewhere in their EHR system to figure out who were their highest risk patients, who are their chronic care patients, who do we need to be reaching out to to understand and give them more education than our general patient population, that information may exist in your EHR. People had no idea of how to actually get to that information and utilize it. So thinking going forward, a lot of people put in these EHR systems to meet the requirements of meaningful use, not thinking about what would I like to get out of my EHR? What information would, as a physician, would actually be helpful for me to care for my patients and actually do good decision-making by them and have a better team-based care and coordination for my patients to maximize their outcomes and the value we're providing for them? So thinking about that going forward. So that's within the specific physician practice. For hospitals that are thinking about their alignment with their physician practices, know that that alignment's being disrupted right now. There are independent practices that we're going to see continued consolidation. There are several that have, are physicians who are saying, I can't make it anymore. COVID hit me too hard. I'm closing up shop. Or, what it, or this is changing my retirement plans. I'm actually working with a practice right now that is buying up several other practices that where the physicians are saying, you know what, I'm going to accelerate my retirement by the next within the next four years. So I need a different kind of transition plan than if I had a 10 year horizon. A lot of groups that are coming up and thinking about this are recognizing that hospitals might be distracted. They're working about their own financial um, outcomes right now and trying to figure out how to get back on their feet. So we're going to see a rise of things such as super groups, private equity taking advantage of this, and then the non-traditional providers, Walmart, Google Health, Amazon, your CVS, all those different areas that some people might think of as just disruptors, they're going to be the ones that physician practices might reach out to to acquire them if they're thinking about how can I stay afloat going forward if I can't do it independently. Oftentimes the hospital could be a great partner for them, but if, they're, if the hospital is distracted, somebody else is going to scoop in. And the high risk for physician independent practices in this time is if they're faced risking bankruptcy or very concerned about their financial distress, they might actually rush to a decision making where they end up getting um, purchased at a very discounted price and not being able to appropriately assess what is the best fit and best option for them. So I highly encourage any practice that is considering this is to take, take a pause, slow down, evaluate your options fully rather than just responding to who comes in first.
Um, as Jonathan mentioned, in order for hospitals to consider buying up some of these practices, if they're going to, or thinking about their alignment strategies, think about the ways that you can do it in an optimized way to maximize the cash. A lot of times people think about buying up the practices as this is automatically going to be negative to the bottom line, but I'm trying to get maximum patient lives. And I'm trying to maximize my alignment. It doesn't necessarily have to always be negative to the bottom line if you can understand how to utilize that practice to unlock additional cash opportunities. One of the things that we've seen is that practices that were still being paid off of some sort of capitation or were in some value-based reimbursement overall have fared significantly better under COVID than those that have been on fee-for-service. So if you've been toddling along that fee-for-service line and wondering whether or not you should move to value-based, COVID was a big wake-up call when you saw your fee-for-service revenue really dry up. And so evaluate the kind of strategies that you can do to actually move you further along that spectrum to prepare you for what is going to be, I think, a very accelerated pace towards moving towards that value-based reimbursement if you haven't all done so. The other piece is when you're reopening, if you're thinking about this, what are your ancillary partners doing? Notice that there, there's always going to be an impact on this continuum of care. So if I'm working with a surgery center, they need to be thinking about when they are scheduling these surgeries, is rehab available? Am I going to be able to get the lab work I need to schedule these surgeries? What about the physician practices? What work needs to be redone in evaluating whether or not we actually make these scheduling? So have those conversations with all of your ancillary partners, not just thinking about and looking at yourself in a box of what you need to do, but what is, how is this going to be impact others downstream? Because if you're going to schedule a surgery that was put off, say a knee replacement, but the patient is not going to be able to get the rehab that they need going forward or be able to fit in their follow-up visits, you need to push that surgery off until later. Make sure that they have the capacity and throughput to accommodate. And the last thing is, is with regards to, I've been getting questions about provider recruitment and retention. A lot of people might have had to furlough physicians during this time or reassess how they were utilizing them. They might have shifted them to utilizing them more for COVID response, if that's the case. They've also um, had physicians that have decided that they want to cut back on their hours. And so what does this mean for your recruitment, right? If you have had physicians that you've had to furlough, how do you bring them back and how do you make it advantageous to both groups? Um, university hospitals, Intermountain, HCA hospitals, several different hospitals have had to cut physician pay during this time to maintain their cash flows. And so in thinking about this, how are you going to pay these physicians to come back? Do you have the cash available? Does your compensation arrangement need to look different than it did before? A lot of physicians who were paid previously on work RVUs are those some of them that have been hit the hardest during this time because they've relied on that, that volume workload for their compensation. If the volume's not there, that means in Q2, when they're doing their reconciliation, that they ended up ha either having to have clawbacks based off of their agreements or significant pay cuts. Can you keep them whole? How would you do so? What is appropriate under Stark? Keep in mind under Stark regulations, there were a lot of waivers for COVID and that you were allowed to address preserving medical practice access through, and that was waived for Stark, but you still need to have that evaluated from your compensation. Those were very, very limited. It was not a blanket waiver that some people expected that anything you did during COVID could have been covered. So in thinking about how you make your physicians whole now or how you contract with them going forward, all of that is subject to all the penalties of Stark and anti-kickback. And the last thing is, how do you retain these physicians? Um, you might have to make adjustments for what their volume expectations are, that they're going to say, I got burned out during COVID or it, 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 um, I don't have the same access to staff and now you're asking me to do more things in my practice. So and I, so I can no longer hit the thresholds that you've created for me historically. Are your previous agreements still appropriate? And then on top of that, the technological support. Now as a physician, if I know, have, know that I'm going to have increased demands of having to do practice visits through telehealth, that might be something that a physician, especially those who had a lot of pains during EHR conversions, they might not be up for all the different technological aspects that you need to do with telehealth. A lot of hospitals that I've talked to, they remember that how disruptive EHR was with their alignment with their physicians. A lot of physicians were unhappy about the EHR system that the hospital might have selected. So you need to make sure that you're conversing with those physicians and keeping them on board and part of the conversation 
on how you're going to select your technology going forward. I was talking to a practice earlier that has four different kinds of EHR systems, one for scheduling, one for the actual patient records, one for rescheduling, for follow-up visits for patients, and one for patient reminders. And having four different systems that aren't integrated well becomes another technological burden for those providers. So if they're not part of that conversation, they are going to have a significant amount of kickback against that and are going to look for hospitals and health systems that will work with them and involve them in those conversations on how they're gonna do that going forward. Thank you, uh, Opal, very much for that. And thank you, Jonathan and Eric, for your presentations as well. What we'd like to do is uh, turn over to uh, questions that have been submitted. Um, I'd also like to remind folks uh, that are attending the webinar, there is an option to submit questions during the webinar as well. Um, and Opal, because you went last, I'm gonna start with you. Uh, question, um, given the current environment and the challenges that are, are posed, many of which you outlined, would you advise a hospital to actively be purchasing independent practices at this time or exploring other alignment options? What are your thoughts? Um, the big thing is, is I ha I, even before COVID, I would say that you need to consider all of your alignment strategies. I think too frequently people hop into the, the solution that we have to buy the practice, that that's the only solution to create alignment. And anytime I hear that, I say, when was the last time you went up to your employed positions and just because you said jump, they said how high? So just because you employ and buy the practice doesn't mean you're going to be strongly aligned. Um, you, some of the best alignment strategies I've seen are actually with the independent practices. So I would have that conversation first is I would go to your independent practices and do it proactively. Don't wait until they come and talk to you about whether or not say, hey, we're in financial distress. Do you want to buy us? Go and reach out to every single one of the independent practices in your community right now. See how they're doing. Understand where they are financially. You can even take advantage of a lot of the RHC opportunities that Jonathan was talking about under PSA arrangements where you might purchase the practice itself, but then the physicians still get to exercise a certain amount of independence and doing it through a PSA arrangement for the specific physician services. So understand all of your different alignment strategies. Employment is not, or employment and acquisition is not the only one. And it tends to be very costly if you don't understand what you're doing um, with regards to that. And I would also say, if you are looking to do acquisition, make sure you do a proper valuation and don't just pay, I'm going to add, buy the, assets of the practice and pay what the physician thinks it's worth because then you end to start an anti-kickback problems, but it also may not be commercially reasonable. It might not be able to be sustainable for you financially if you put in an, um, an overpriced purchase price to compete with say private equity or super group. Great, thank, thank you. Um, Jonathan, a question that came in during the webinar for you um, related to revenue optimization, um, what are your thoughts about FQHC reimbursement as an option um, and, and FQHCs as an opportunity? And a follow-up question to that, are there vehicles available to critical access hospitals to work in conjunction with FQHCs on some unique organizational model? So to answer the first question, um, FQHCs is always an opportunity, and whether you're going to qualify for the 330 grant or you're going to be an FQHC lookalike, um, generally what turns a lot of people off to FQHCs is the governance requirements um, associated with that. So due to the restrictions to operate as an FQHC, there's a very limited number of hospitals that can actually own and operate an FQHC. Um, the exception to those is actually government-owned or municipally-owned uh, uh, entities can actually own and operate an FQHC, and there's only a couple of those out there in the country. Um, usually what we've seen is that an FQHC that wants to enter into that type of arrangement or agreement with a hospital system or an independent hospital is where the FQHC ends up owning and operating the hospital. So there's no restrictions on an FQHC being able to own and operate hospitals. The restriction is really on who can own and operate an FQHC. QHC. 
Now, you can always partner with an FQHC and not have an actual combined ownership or shared ownership structure. Um, the, rate, the rate for an FQHC is definitely favorable. Um, it's $165 to $170, depending upon the geographic adjustment of that rate. Um, so it is favorable and the ability to get the 330 grant. Um, there is a significant amount of regulatory burden that is also associated with being the SQHC. So what I would say is to, to approach that as an opportunity if, if you meet those requirements to actually be able to own and operate one or find out if you can enter into that relationship. But I wouldn't go head forward into that unless I really understood the ramifications and the, the barriers to ownership or that shared relationship. But we should definitely be partnering with providers. Um, I think that what's happened over time is FQHCs in particular in critical access hospitals have really served as competitors to each other. So that's really led to a lot of duplication of services within communities that could otherwise be streamlined. So I think that we definitely need to look at those opportunities, but I think first it just starts with the conversation of realizing what both provide, how you can leverage both opportunities, but then also what we're regulatorily and legally able to do. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, Eric, um, for critical access hospitals, what is your understanding of the Medicare cost report treatment um, for um, uh, various programs, uh, including the PPP and uh, PHSSEF funds? Boy, Jeff, that is the question everyone is asking right now. Um, the, there's been no guidance has come out from CMS, at least that, that we're aware of, or HHS. Um, I know NRHA, Tommy Barnhart led a group of folks, uh, if you were on the NRHA grassroots distribution, they did a position paper where Tommy organized a group of um, kind of financial leaders in the industry to, to pull together a white paper that addressed this issue. But um, um, so anybody who is looking for that, you can either find that with NRHA or I, I have a copy I can get to you. Uh, but 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 um, so part of the answer is it depends on what part of the CARES Act. For example, the PPP um, was and, and there's no because there's no guidance in HH, uh, from HHS or CMS. We just have to go with what we know of the cost report rules through the Provider Reimbursement Manual. And and if we think about the PPP as an offset to our our expense structure, um, almost like a rebate. Then, that, then those are expenses that we would actually you know, almost drop into our cost report as an A8 adjustment to reduce our expense structure. So that's one, that's that piece. Um, the second is, uh, for example, the general distribution funds and the PFSSEF funds, the general and the targeted. Um, these were set up as grants. Grants do not require uh, are not required to offset ex expenses. So. In absence of any uh, guidance from CMS to the contrary, if we follow the provider reimbursement rules, we would not have to use those um, those grant dollars, the three million, the four million dollar grant dollars, to offset um, um, ex expenses um, um, from from our cost report. Um, you know, so so as I, I began thinking about this, you know, the real issue is 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 you know what happens to a critical access hospital. So I kind of jotted down an example. You know, let's just take an example of a $30 million net revenue critical access hospital that has $30 million in expenses and a 50% cost-based reimbursed uh, um, kind of business, a payer mix. Um, so, you know, in, in theory, what would happen is if, if the P we receive $5 million in PPP funds, um, our expense structure would drop down to, to uh, 25 million, right? From 30 million minus five is 25 million. And our revenue would actually drop back from 15 million, which is 50% of the 30 million, that's your Medicare payer mix, to 12.5. So yeah, we would see a reduction in Medicare revenue, but we would also see a reduction in our expenses that was twice that. Um, now let's take a look at what happens when we all of a sudden lose 50% of our revenue because our volumes go down. So for half our business, we would lose 50% of that revenue, we would lose you know, seven and a half million dollars. Um, for the Medicare piece, you really, they, their revenue would remain constant at your expenses, which would be the expenses, their portion of the expenses net of the PPP dollars. And so they would maintain at 12.5. 
So Medicare revenue would be now 12.5 million. Commercial and non-cost based revenue would drop in half from 15 down to uh, seven and a half. So you would have net revenue of, of, of $20 million in costs of 25, you'd have a net loss of $5 million. I know that's confusing and if anybody wants, I can put together a quick model to show, but that $5 million new loss, in my uh, opinion, is the loss that can be reflected to take into your revenue the, 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 the general distribution fund and targeted distribution funds. Again, those, those, those distribution funds can only be used to cover lost revenue that is not payable by other sources. The portion of your Medicare payer mix, you know, that 50%, even though your volume's gone down, your revenue stays constant. So Jeff, you asked a simple question <laughs> that is incredibly complicated without any guidance other than what we have seen in the provider reimbursement manual, um, you know, kind of related to um, um, co cost-based rules. So I, I, I'm sure that was clear as mud for everyone. Uh, reach out to me if you have any comments or questions or if you have any different way of thinking. Jonathan, is that the way you see it and that you deal with the cost report quite often? Johnson. Yeah, I mean, Johnson it's on spot on with what you're saying, Eric. I think that until there's that additional guidance, um, any guess is the best guess compared to the next. Um, and all we really have is historical context and, and prior information regarding the cost reports as to really how we can do this. But unless Medicare comes out and actually defines something different relative to the PPP funding, we're going to have to follow the established policies and procedures regarding the recognition of the revenue and then also the offsets of cost structure going forward. Thanks. Thanks, Jonathan. Quick question for you, Jonathan. Um, are, are operators allowed to create an RHC on the campus of another hospital? Yeah, so it's, and I just had a conversation, it's actually a good question. I had a conversation about this a couple weeks ago too with another hospital system that was asking. The key is, is that with the rural health clinic, because from the Medicare perspective, it's, it's deemed its own entity, it will actually receive its own Medicare CCN number. So long as you meet the requirements of the rural health clinic and you're actually able to carve out and differentiate the space between the two entities, you can actually operate a rural health clinic on the campus of another facility. Um, we know of many facilities that are actually doing this. There's a, there's a system that leases the medical office building on their main campus to the critical access hospital to own or to operate that rural health clinic. There's other ones that have actually carved out pieces of their hospital proper. So the key is, is that can we address the, the differentiation of space to ensure that we're only allocating cost appropriately? But as long as we meet all the different requirements, yes, we can simply uh, put, we can operate a rural health clinic on another hospital's campus. The key is, is that it needs to be in a rural area. It needs to be in a shortage area. Those are the two biggest requirements. Um, as long as we meet those and meet the other requirements around rural health clinics, such as the APP, primary care, and such and such, yes, we can establish one. Great, thank you. Did, yeah, yeah, so so just want to comment. Um, Remember when he said this? All of these rules and regulations related to COVID and, and the distributions are all fluid. Um, just got an email from from uh, um, somebody on the webinar that that while I was actually preparing for this talk, the American Hospital Association just put out um, 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 a, a memorandum uh, today um, saying that 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 providers that have received emergency relief payments do not need to submit a quarterly report to HHS or the Pandemic Response Authority Committee. So um, I, I stand corrected, um, but gosh, it just happened today. So um, I missed that one. Eric, I'm, I'm disappointed that you <laughs> weren't you able go. to incorporate that in, but I appreciate uh, the attendee who pointed that out. It's uh, one way we all uh, stay on top of this is by learning from each other, and uh, it is changing real time, uh, as, as we are all well aware. Um, Opal, um, a question for you. Uh, for health systems and hospitals that uh, have providers on produ productivity-based uh, payment uh, modalities, obviously they took a significant hit in compensation during the disruption from COVID. Um, the question would be, um, under what circumstances can a hospital or health system make those providers whole? 
um, for the, the lost income or revenue? Well, so first and foremost, I would say, you know, is it appropriate to make them whole, right? So there, this was part of the stark blanket wait, I say blanket, the blanket waiver that was issued where if keeping them whole is necessary to ensure the ongoing services in that community. So basically, if not making them whole is going to cost you to end up no longer being able to provide those services in your community, then you are allowed to put in additional remuneration that um, under Stark and anti-kickback regulations to put that into their compensation. Now, keep in mind, physicians are under, you, you're tied, when it looks at Stark and anti-kickback from a fair market value, it looks at the contract when it was drafted. So if you have a contract that is in place and say that goes all the way, you know, it's a two-year contract that goes until next year, and so they've had these reduced work RVUs that they're not going to make up, can you do a payment to cover, you know, the, the time period that the work RVU productivity was down? You might adjust your work RVU rate, but again, it whether or not that it's appropriate under the Stark waivers is, are you going to lose that service? Now, what you need to document to that is when you say you might lose that service, it's not about did, are you going to lose that physician. If you lose that physician, but somebody else would be willing to come in and perform those services at a rate that is more commercially reasonable and more in line with fair market value, then you're not able to make that physician whole. But I would start with the question of, you know, how well aligned are you with the physicians? How can you guys get on the same page and find an appropriate balance rather than just saying, how do we need to make them whole? Have that conversation. I mean, a lot of the groups um, that have been having, talking to their physicians about pay cuts, I've talked to a lot of physicians that are very open to saying, hey, we need to keep the ship afloat and we need to preserve access to care in our community. I'm one of the people who can afford to take a bit of a hit right now and to make sure that we have the appropriate services in our community. So that's the conversation I would actually start with before asking, can we make them whole? If the answer in doing that is the physician really is in a position, especially like, for example, um, family medicine physicians happen to already be one of the lowest paid specialties that are out there already. So for them, most of them are not on a work RVU productivity, but they might be on a panel size. And so how can you make adjustments to their compensation that takes into account the quality outcomes? And so how did they care for their chronic care patients during this time to allow you to adjust their compensation during the COVID pandemic rather than saying, okay, your panel size was down during this period of time? Great. Thank, thank you, Opal. Um, one question that came in, and it, it was talking about the interim cost report discussion that we had earlier and how that impacts Medicare Advantage. Comment was, I realized that as a critical access hospital, we're losing money from the managed care organizations this year. Mm -hmm. But if volumes come back next year, then they'll be overpaying. And in some cases, paying more than the cost for combined years. Th that would allow the MCOs to essentially reverse the argument back onto the critical access hospitals in the subsequent year. What, what is your, your response to, to that concern? I am thinking that the MCOs are going, or the Medicare Advantage plans are going to figure out how to not pay those higher rates for all of next year. Whether that be that, that, that um, you know, because often your MAC is going to require, you know, quarterly, you submit your cost information, they reset rates. I got to believe that there's going to be pressure for that to happen. So um, I, I'd rather have, you know, a bird in the hand as we're through in the bush. And I'd rather have that bird in hand right now. Cash is king. Cash is king. Right. Um, thank you. One last question I think we can sneak in here, uh, possibly. And uh, I'll go to uh, Jonathan. Um, FQHCs and RHCs, uh, as a result of some, some regulatory changes uh, pertaining to, to the pandemic, have been allowed to serve as distant telehealth sites. Do you see this lasting or continuing in the future? Good question. Um, you know, I, I know there's definitely a push right now uh, to expand that more permanently. I know there's legislation that's actually been introduced to permanently expand FQHC and RHC services to serve as distant sites. Um, I, I think there's some things, you know, there's definitely a need 
And, and I think that there's definitely a probability that it will be expanded, um, maybe not immediately, but over time. Um, but also, too, there are some regulatory things and some different things that will have to be put in place to ensure that people don't take advantage of the programs based on how the regulations are currently written. So uh, I think that it's definitely a need. And as we see a further decline in people either wanting to travel or also a, a more, uh, you know, push for people wanting to get telehealth services, I think that we're going to have to expand to include rural health clinics and FQHCs. We just need to make sure that we do it tactfully so that we don't either owe their tax the system or put uh, things in place that allow people to take advantage of the system that is in place now. Great. Well, with that, I, I certainly want to thank our panel, Opal, Jonathan, and Eric for their expertise today and very much want to thank all of our attendees for your time and your passion uh, in ensuring that our communities have uh, continued access to high quality health care. If there are follow-up questions, uh, please feel free to reach out to our panelists. Um, and uh, again, thank you for all that you do on behalf of our communities.